didn't really feel like bare bones to me. Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good to see all of you. We have a few new faces and a few family faces. Let's be in special prayer this morning, like Steve said, for the team at camp. Impacting over 100 teams showing up from all over. It's a pretty amazing thing. It, I, was, I was thinking about that a little bit on a side note here. You are, when we are doing that, so we're all created to be in his image and to rule and reign on this earth. And the impact you have when you have over 100 teens, a young, young creators together, that you change their life and direct them into creating his kingdom here on earth. That's a pretty amazing thought. Pretty amazing concept to wrap your mind around. God is good to us. And we can live in his kingdom and do things like that and have fun doing them. His kingdom is an amazing thing. Father, we thank you for who you are to us. We're so grateful for your spirit, for your son, Jesus, and what he did for us. That we can be free, that we can harvest what you have planted. Lord, that we honor you with, with your kingdom, bringing it here to this earth, and that we make this world a better place because of who you are in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so grateful for the opportunity that we have to do those things. If you think about it, if, if you think about your old self, where you were before you, became, you received new life, the concept of what kingdom living is and what you were doing in everyday life is an amazing thing. Because what you were really impacting is a supernatural kingdom that we're bringing to this earth. It's an amazing thing. My, my sermon this morning is on perspective affects your authority. Now, I'm talking specifically this morning, I'm not talking about an authority where you are the boss of everybody around you or an external authority. I'm talking about your internal. There's an internal authority that you have to rule and reign your own heart, your own soul, your own will, and your own emotions. And sometimes we struggle with living that out in everyday life. Sometimes we, it doesn't line up with what the Word teaches, with what we know is true, and with what is going all around us. So I want to speak to that a little bit this morning and teach on that. Because it's very important, I believe, if we want to have a spiritual authority externally, it has to be based on a foundation of an internal authority. Where your internal authority is standing on kingdom principles. And in knowing his righteousness, and knowing his truth, and knowing who he is, who I am, and what he is going to do in front of me. So I want to start with a little bit. They're working on projector there, so we're good in here in a little bit. So I want to start a little bit with how do we change the authority that we have? Because me personally, I had, see, God's promises are yes and amen, right? His promises are, his, your agreement doesn't affect whether his promise is available. Because his promise is a guaranteed thing. It's, it's his kingdom. Some of them are precepts that if you do this, you will receive this. And some of them are just simply yours if you pick them up and do them. So to live and agree with his promises in me personally in the past, I didn't have his promises manifesting in my life. But it wasn't because his promises weren't true or that God was withholding the promises from me. It was because I didn't have the revelation or understanding of walking in them. Or even I discounted the ability that I had to pick them up and live with his promises. So 
the amazing part is his promises are yes and amen. They're always, they, don't, they don't fluctuate. They don't go to and fro. They don't disappear. They stick with you through your entire life. The swivel on that is whether we agree with them to pick them up. Because you can live an entire life without understanding his righteousness, without picking up his joy, and without receiving his peace. Amen. Just by not picking these up. His promises are yes and amen. So what I want to talk about this morning is internally taking an authority over your soul and your spirit and your will and your emotion that you line them up, that you are able to manifest his promises externally so let's i'm going to go to uh psalms 116 that is not on the slide because i got this after i had already dropped it for the guys in the back so i'm going to read psalms 116 it says in verse one it says i love the lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. And then it says, Then I called on the name of the Lord, and I said, O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Listen to this. In verse 7 it says, Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with me, with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears and my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. That's where it brought me to in Romans 14, 17. The cup of our salvation is righteousness by faith, right? It is the righteousness that we walk in by faith even when it doesn't manifest right in front of our faces see righteousness by faith righteousness true righteousness where you do things god's way is a symptom of righteousness by faith if you try to do righteous before you do the faith part you'll be living in law because you'll be constantly searching for right and wrong and applying that to your life. And it will lead to a road of destruction because you'll always, you'll always know inside of you that there's some wrong, right? There's some wrong, right? There's something inside of you that makes a lot of mistakes. And if we are focusing on that, we miss the concept of righteousness by faith. Because righteousness by faith is saying, I made a mistake here, but I have faith that I'm going to get it right. Anything that I make mistakes in, I have faith, I have something I have not attained yet, that I will get it right. Not just get it right, but make it right. Make it right. That's good. I can also make it right. Because the true righteousness is simply a symptom of righteousness by faith, according to his word. 
Don't put the cart before the horse. If you want to focus on just being righteous, you'll, you'll be struggling to push the cart. You have to put your faith in your righteousness so that you can live in righteous living. Some, sometimes we get misaligned in that. We get focused on what's right and what's wrong that we miss the faith part. See, it creeps in the old, the old, the old Pharisee law mindset can creep into your life and damage your inner spirit by the fact that you focus too much on what's right and what's wrong and you don't do it by faith. Because faith sets you free. Faith gives you an opportunity to walk freely and to walk, move forward. So I'm going to move, move on with the slide. If you guys get it up, pop it up. I'm going to keep going. Perspective affects your authority. Um, Scripture is on Romans 14, 17 this morning. And I want to touch on what I mean by perspective. A perspective that you have is a mental view or a prospect is the description of it. It is, another description of it is the capacity to view things in their true relations or of relative importance. That is capacity, how you look at things is your perspective. And how you look at things decides whether you pick up his promises or whether you leave them lay and don't do anything with them. That's a pretty important part of us living in the kingdom. Yet I don't feel like we touch on it a lot or understand it very well. That we want to shift how we view and look at life and God and, and His kingdom in everyday walks. So authority, the meaning of authority. My wife gave me this when, she was, when I was studying for this sermon. The word authority, broken down, is... so. The word author and I-T-Y, the suffix of it. So you are the author of your quality, state, or degree of where you're at. That's authority. You are the author of your state or degree of where you're at now. That's what the, the root word of authority stands for. That's the meaning of it. That is something that is an internal authority that what I'm talking about. So... Authority is to be able to tell or control what is going on. Maybe control isn't a good word for it. A, a presence that you have what it takes to move forward in, in something in the moment, in your present state. So let's go to Romans 14, 17. Let's go to that scripture. Now, a, a little background on Romans 14, it's talking about how eating and drinking certain things, <coughs> excuse me, eating and drinking certain things is not how you walk into the kingdom of God. And to me, that even goes further than that. Material things is not how you walk into the kingdom of God. What you have, what you don't have, <coughs> excuse me, does not affect what you do in the kingdom of God. And now the kingdom of God has material things. But that material thing doesn't decide whether you're living in the kingdom of God or not. Seven, verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. And then here it says, But of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, <coughs> excuse me. The reason it says righteousness first, and then it says joy, and then it says peace, is because it comes in that order. When I was studying this, God showed me when you skip righteousness and you just t try to have joy and peace doesn't work very well 
And I was even thinking about it this morning. I realized it lines up with what Steve has taught about the basis. If you skip the righteousness part and you try to move to joy, joy is being in a state of joy or, or a state of trusting when chaos comes knocking on your door. That you can handle a lot of things that are going on around you and you still have joy. It comes deep from deep within you. God gives you something that no other, you can't get it from anywhere else. It's something that nobody can take from you. Your happiness can be taken from you. Joy can't. Joy is in here. It's God manifesting in you. So opportunities for us to lay down our joy is, comes back to your perspective. Your perspective is the root of how you look at things. So righteousness is the standard. Now, if we put that on the basic concept... Joy is where you're walking and leading and and doing things and ministering and you still have Him. Right? And then third base is where you have peace. Peace in whatever's going on. You know that His peace is still yours. Right? You can be adjusting your soul. You can be adjusting your spirit. When I preached a few weeks ago on... Thank you. Uh, Much better. When I preached on when Jacob was behind the hill waiting, knowing Esau is coming, knowing that that, that, that chaos or that opposition is coming, and you have peace, because you know that God is in front of you, that He is for you, and that He is helping you adjust what is needed in your own heart. Because frustration isn't a fruit of the Spirit. Frustration is not something that is manifesting God. But, I believe God uses frustration to help us align so that helps us to come to the end of ourselves. Frustration is not a terrible thing. It is a God-given adjustment saying, it's, it's more like a check engine light. Check your engine. Check and see what's going on. If you're frustrated, when I'm frustrated, guess what? I know something is not quite right. Something is not lining up. And, in, and it's in my perspective is what's not lining up. My truth is what's not lining up. Because it's never God that is moving His truth around waiting for us to, to follow it and find it. It's up to me to align and pick up His promises and His righteousness. So let's, let's go to Romans 4.4. 4. Let's touch on the righteousness part. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So let's break, down that, break that down a little bit. The one who, who does something for his, for his payment. If you do it so that you get something, when you get something, that's your payment. It comes as his due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So when you are, the work, we get caught up a lot with the works thing where we don't want to work to gain righteousness. But we are missing something there when we don't put works, we try to take works out of everything. We still have to do stuff. We still have to minister we still have to help we still have to love 
We still have to serve. We have to do all these things. But if you, don't, if you do them as a payment to say that I'm good enough or that I'm, I am now owed, I am now owed this honor or this position or this whatever you're trying to attain, the status, then you, you're missing the righteousness by faith. If we take the position and we put the cart in front of the cart behind the horse and put the horse in front of the cart, if we line that up, now we have faith, and then the things that we are doing is now an internal gift. It is an eternal reward. And you no longer receive it here on earth. You can. I'm saying it is no longer a payment that you are due at the end of the week because you did this. It is now something that is a supernatural gift that is going to come back and reward you. That is a simple, if you switch that perspective in your mind, it is a completely different walk in life. And the kingdom of God lives in that. It is in righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Now you are walking in a totally different position. In a totally different freedom. I believe there's a bondage in doing things in order to receive things. In position and status. I believe there's a bondage in that because then you are controlling and manipulating the reason that you were, you were doing whatever, the reason you were serving, the reason you were, are worshiping, the reason... See, God doesn't, doesn't go to and fro according to your righteousness. It's the other way around. You know, I can, we're going to hit and we're going to touch on that later when, when Samuel is struggling with that. But we have the benefit of serving a God that never moves and never changes yet is always doing something new every single day. Isn't that amazing? He's always new, doing something new, but he never changes. So the newness that we see every day is simply him getting to know us, or us getting to know him a little bit more every single day. That's the new of God. Yet God is already all of that in your entire life experiences. In Romans 4, 3, before 4, 4, it says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed. That's all he did. Now, who is our father of the entire faith community in the church today? Is Abraham. Simply because he believed when things didn't look the way that God said it was going to look. That is now our following. That is now who we look up to. That is our, our, our physical father of the, of the church. But Christ gives us the opportunity to have a boundless, a boundless imagination. A, it's, it's a prophetic thing that we live and dream and look forward to. See, that's why it's very important to have an imagination, to live in hope, to live and, and be looking forward to the new things in life. See, it says in... It says in uh, where is the Scripture? It talks about looking back on the plow. The kingdom of God is not fit for a man that looks back on the plow. See, it, if you're looking back at your past, if you're looking at what's behind you, the mistakes you've made. Now, I don't know how many of you have plowed in your life, truly plowed, the physical plowing of, of farming. I have done a lot behind horses as a, as a young boy. And... When you are constantly in a state of looking back to see how you did, you miss what you're going to be doing. And it gets pretty crooked. It gets pretty back and forth. 
It doesn't show a, a true example of His heaven here on earth. Because the manifestation of His heaven here on earth is us walking in freedom and righteousness, right? That's what we want. That's what the church is, is needed, the, the bride to be spotless. We have to put the righteousness by faith before we put righteousness. Does that make sense? Am I making sense to you guys? Now, I want to go into Acts 10. Acts 10, it shows us a different... We were talking about personal righteousness up to this point, but let's talk about how we perceive other people's righteousness, right? So if I have that available to me, I also know if you have Christ, you have that available to you. Right? My brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow church family, and I'm not talking about Griner Church, I'm talking about the church, the bride, they have this same righteousness available to them. And Peter, in Acts 10, in verse 9, he was on a journey, and he was just hanging out on the rooftop, taking it easy, and he was, he was hungry. But he fell, and had a, fell into a trance and had a vision. In verse 9, in Acts 10, it says, And the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching their city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Verse 11, he says, It saw the heavens opened, and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there was a voice to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, Peter is coming from the Jewish standpoint of he's never eaten anything that is unclean by God's law. This is what he's feeling in his spirit. This is what he's arguing with God about. He's saying, I've never eaten something that isn't good for me or that isn't clean. And then the voice said, came to him again in the second time and said, what God has made clean, do not call common. Now let's look at that a little bit this morning. What God has made clean, do not call common. Let's put that in my words and the metaphor that I see this, what this is saying. When God has made your brother righteous, do not call it common. Do not degrade it. Do not bring it down. Do not take it away from them by your words or by your actions. What God has made righteous and made clean, do not call common. Now, Peter, the, the reason this vision was coming was Peter was going to a Gentile's house and he was going to share with the Gentile. Uh, what, was, what was his name? Cornelius. I knew, I knew somebody would know that. Cornelius. He was a man that knew God or knew who God was and even wanted to follow God's principles, but yet he was a Gentile. He was not allowed into the kingdom. And I see some of that creeping back into church as the whole church where we want to, we want to discount someone's righteousness by the way they look and by the way they act. What position would the church be in if you would have a group of Harley riders and ex-drug addicts and homeless people walk into church one morning? 
I'm talking in the church in general, the bride. What position would we take today if that would happen? Because anyone by faith is then made righteous. Now, obviously we all have growth and are being sanctified as we walk. But that is between God and them and how they are growing. If we, get, if we are given permission and we are walking as brothers and sisters in love, then we help them. But Jesus said in his own words, he said, judge not so that you aren't judged. Because if you judge someone in, their, in the way they appear, in their material type of what they do, uh, how they act, um, their demeanor, if you judge someone in that, you will be judged by the same manner. That's what he says, very simply. So this is, I believe, what Peter is saying, or what, why Peter is having this vision is, do not call common what God has made clean. Don't judge someone's righteousness when God has made them righteous by faith. Does that make sense to you? Does that make what I'm trying to communicate is the church needs to adjust and, ex and extend the same grace that I ex have for myself to my brothers and sisters. I extend that same thing. Because so many times, when, if we haven't experienced it, we want to judge it. Sometimes we... Our, our brother is going through something and it's really tough and we pass judgment on how they're handling it and they may be handling it wrong but we judge it because we haven't lived it ourselves. That's why we overcome by the word of our testimony. We went through the test and now we help that person, the next person, our brother and sister, walk through that in a better way. Because we overcome by our test that we had before. What sucks about that is the best, the best, the most powerful people in ministry have walked through a lot of tests. That, that you, there's, there's some truth to that. I'm not saying you, that's a standard that you have to live by, but the most powerful people that are, that are ministering to others, they've went through some stuff. So when you're going through some stuff, your ministry may be growing. Change your perspective. Your ministry is changing. Hallelujah. I don't want the ministry I had a year ago. And a year from now, I won't want the ministry I have today. Because God is helping me grow and promoting me, changing my anointing to where I need to be. It's a constant stepping forward and moving forward. Now let's jump back a little bit. I, step, I, I talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to read the Scripture. 4.16, Romans 4.16. It says, for this, for, reason, for this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. What a lot of what I just spoke about is in this scripture. To also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, Sometimes, I'm going to jump back a little bit on the law and the grace part. So, when we step out of our culture that we lived in, so I, I grew up Amish. When we step out of it, when we are no longer that, sometimes, sometimes we consider ourselves free, right? Because we are no longer in that. I would say not sometimes, a lot of times. 
we consider ourselves freer because we are no longer in that bondage. Now let me challenge you with something. What if you would step back and put the Amish clothes on or do something that you used to do in your past? Would you still be free? Because the freedom part isn't in, isn't in what you eat or what you drink. The freedom part is not in your materials. So if you just change your clothes and you're still in bondage where you can't, where you can't step back and do... So basically what I'm saying is we can do anything material-wise as far as how we dress or what, what type of clothes you wear or, or what, how you do your job or like that type of thing or if you drive a truck, like that's what I'm saying. We can do any of those and that's not where the kingdom of God is. So if we step away from our culture where it was legalism and it was a, a bondage thing and yet we couldn't freely mingle with those people, then I don't believe you've been set free. You may be in a different freedom, you may be in a different walk of life, but true freedom is being able to rub shoulders with your brothers and sisters that may be in a different place and, ex and extending the same grace to them that we have received. Am I making sense? This is, this is something I see a lot in the church, especially in our area and our culture, is because we go back. We, 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 we step away from a, a, a ministry of bondage or of control, and when we step back into or mingle with our brothers and sisters, we go back into bondage. That, in the kingdom of God, that is a problem. Because we agreed, the reason we stepped away from it is because it's not about your material things. But when we step back into it and we can't, we can't be in freedom, I, I could put on Amish clothes today and go hang out at, an, at, a, at a different setting than I am today. Would it probably mess with my mind a little bit? I'm guessing it would. And with theirs. <laughs> and with theirs. But the fact is it doesn't change the principles of Scripture. It doesn't change this truth. It doesn't change your righteousness by faith. It doesn't change the grace that you give and receive. That doesn't change. It's how you perceive it is how you're gonna is how you're gonna look at it. So don't perceive it in a way that brings you back into bondage. Perceive it in a way that keeps you in a place of righteousness, joy, and peace. That we don't lay that down. Never lay that down. That is the number one concept of kingdom living. Don't lay your righteousness down. Don't lay your joy down. And don't lay your peace down. That's never worked out for anyone. Let's, set, let's finish in Acts 10 and, and verse 28. And he, said, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Peter is saying this to Cornelius. He's showing a different heart of God to Cornelius. Because Cornelius' perspective was that he was a Gentile. And he was in the physical but Cornelius didn't understand that by faith he could be made a child of God. And what happened to Cornelius' household? All his servants, all his children, all his family became born again and saved. And Peter spent a lot of time there preaching and teaching by this simple concept of what I'm talking about this morning. That's who God is to us. Now, 
Here, here is Luke 9.62 is the scripture I was talking about. Jesus said to, them, to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This, I'm not, this is not a salvation thing. This is saying, in my everyday walk, when I am going forward, and I keep looking at my past, and condemning myself and living in guilt, shame, condemnation, in any sort of way about my past, my rows are going to get awfully wavy. The secret to it is straightforward, and what's next, and vision, and hope, and joy, and, and being and give, having an expectation of what God is going to do. And believing that you're, you're able to receive it. Or that you are worthy of receiving it. Sometimes we struggle with the worthiness part of receiving it. He, he even says, Paul says that, that we all may prophesy when he's talking about the gifts. That we all may prophesy. That's what we all, what he all desires for every. Not all of us have that gift. But he wishes that we all would because that prophesying is looking into the future and applying God's kingdom to our future and dreaming of what's new and next. Now, the opposite of faith is fear, right? It says, fear not. Fear not is mentioned in the Bible 365 times. Which is for every day of the year. Just in case you weren't quite sure about if you should fear not or not today, there's, one, there's a fear not for today. There's a fear not for tomorrow and there was a fear not from yesterday. And there'll be a fear not for every single day of your life coming forward. Don't fear in what God is doing and in the world around you. Don't let the chaos knocking on your door move you into fear. Don't let what you see coming or what you feel is around you move you into fear. Step out of the fear part. Because the fear is a simple discount. You're, you're shifting your perspective and having faith in yourself. When you shift your perspective and have faith in yourself, fear comes in because we are trusting in who God is. We are trusting that what God is going to do in our lives. That's what we are going to do in moving forward. Let's go to 1 Samuel 16. Let's look at an Old Testament story where Samuel, he's the judge and the prophet of Israel in the days of of Saul and David. Samuel was the prophet that guided the, king, the kings and the leaders. They would ask him for direction and he would be the spokesperson for God's kingdom. Now today, each one of us has that in us. Has that spirit in us. So we have a voice speaking to us prophetically. But in, in the Old Testament days, now Samuel is getting up in age. Samuel has walked with Saul. Saul, Saul was the king that was appointed by Israel, right? They wanted a king. They, they were looking at their neighboring kingdoms and saw that they had kings with horses and chariots and castles. And they were like, we want that for ourselves. We want a man to lead us. We want a man to give us direction. We want a physical person to tell us what to do. And so they chose, they, they gave, they chose a man from themselves and anointed him and he became their king. Now this is a good analogy or a good metaphor of self versus God. Saul didn't work out so hot. Saul started looking in different places. He went to a witch to receive direction instead of a prophet, Samuel. He started doing, controlling things that were happening and, and he was doing, making decisions without trusting God and listening to God. 
which is ourselves, our, our fleshly self at times. But Samuel was getting up in his age, and God came to Samuel and, and, and said he's no longer going to have Saul as the king. Now, how many of you in your life, you've lived a long life or done a lot of things and you're in the position you're at? Let's, let's put it in a different place of where, where you live, your job, what you're, what you're walking in today. Did you ever picture yourself being here in the present time? Did you ever know where you were going? Because sometimes disappointment in life, when we're going through problems, we get disappointed. I get disappointed. And I become frustrated with where I'm at. We're struggling in, in relationship or with, with children or with our job or wherever you're at. You may have never pictured you being there in this time. But yet, God has a plan for it. And Samuel was in that position. Samuel had spent his life guiding and helping Saul. And the Lord said, we're going to move on from Saul. Listen to what Samuel was doing. Lord said in verse 16, he says, he says to, to Samuel, he says, how long... Will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? How long will you mourn your past or mourn the position you're in until you move forward? Mourn the change. How long will you mourn the different direction that God is giving you? How long are you going to hang on to what God wants to do for your future, yet it didn't look, doesn't look how I wanted it to look. Work-wise, let's talk about business. Let's talk about that. For me personally, this is a personal perspective. Where I'm at today in business is nothing that I pictured when I started the business. Okay? But... I would not give up one single bit of where I'm at today to go back to the picture that I had when I started the business. Because when I looked, when I started the business, my hopes and my, my perspective of what it would look like was pretty small. I didn't dare dream that where it would be at today. And I know, I know for a fact I personally mourned change for almost a year and a half when God changed the whole thing. Personally mourned it. What good did that do me? Didn't do me a thing. It didn't change anything about where I'm at today. But I was mourning what God was changing when God had a new thing and a better thing that He was giving to me. So, Let's bring this back to where you're at personally. If you're living in disappointment and struggling with where you're at today, God is changing it to give you a better thing. He is giving you a David for your Saul. He's giving you a chance to step out of some of your old past things that weren't that great and moving into something new that is a whole lot better and that is going to manifest God a lot better and is going to bring glory to Him a lot better and to His kingdom. But yet, sometimes we sit and we mourn it because it's hard and it was a struggle to move through it. God said to Samuel, He said, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Now, filling your horn with oil is an anointing, right? He was going to anoint David. So, when God is saying that to us, He's saying, move into the new anointing that He is giving you 
and go do the new thing that he's put before you. Sometimes the death of the old stuff is the best thing that could have happened because if it didn't die, we wouldn't have moved on. I would, have never, I would never be in the place of business I am today if it didn't die when it did because I would have clung to what I thought was right and what I thought was good and what was comfortable. It was comfortable. I knew what was going on. And God wants relationship with us. So when we're comfortable, we struggle sometimes talking to Him. Let's be real. Sometimes when we're comfortable and we feel like we got this thing, the relationship with Him falls off. See, a, <laughs> a mature Christian, see, some of, some, of us, some of us are in crisis mode all the time because if God would let go of, if He would take you out of your crisis, you'd probably stop talking to Him. I didn't get any hallelujahs with that one. If we, if, we were, if, if we were walking out of the crisis we were in, once we are good and everything's kumbaya, are we still the same person that we were when we were in crisis mode? Are we still speaking to Him? Are we still in communion with back and forth with Him? See, an immature Christian lives in crisis mode because that's what God... De- God desires relationship. Right? So an immature Christian sometimes has to live in crisis mode so that they are constantly in relationship with God. What if we would be mature and in prosperity and be in the same relationship where we are constantly speaking and hearing? That's a different... That's a different when I heard this, it brought a lot of revelation to my own heart. Because in my past... When I was closest to God, I was in crisis mode. When my, my, mind, my mindset shifted, and I realized that God is in the prosperity, He is also in the blessing, and the blessing isn't just a symptom of everyday life and how life is going. Blessing is what God is doing today. And then I shifted to a place where I was speaking to Him constantly, even in prosperity. I have a lot to grow in that. Still, today. But my, my check engine light, when it comes on in frustration, I know it's time to uh, adjust that. Add some, add some anointing. Add some anointing to your personal position. And have some more freedom. And have some more kingdom of God. We all love righteousness, joy, and peace. Right? We all love it. We all want it every single moment of every single day. But the exchange we make, when we give that up, the payment isn't that great. When we give, the, when we give up the kingdom of God. I, I spoke mainly on righteousness today, but I believe there will be a, a time of speaking into joy and peace as well. Because while righteousness is the foundation, joy and peace are the next steps that manifest an external of the kingdom of God. An external impact. When, we, when that foundation is founded in our lives and we walk in it, the joy and the peace part sometimes is a perspective of how we look at things again. Because we can understand the righteousness and still be laying down joy and peace. And still not be living in it. Because I want to live in the kingdom of God every single day. I want to be manifesting the kingdom of God every single day. And I want to be living in that freedom every single day. So... I want to know why I don't have it when I don't have it. I want to understand what's going on that I laid it down and I don't feel the joy and I don't feel the peace. What did I lay down? What did I agree to? And there's a lot of godly principles in Scripture that teach about that. 
It gives us answers. It's an amazing, it's an amazing story that allows us to speak to our souls. Like it, like it said in, in Psalms. It says in Psalms several times, David spoke to his soul and told it where to go. He spoke to his soul and said, God is your Savior, or bless the Lord, or praise the Lord. He told his soul, which is our, our part of our physical being, he told his soul to do that. A lot of times we miss telling ourselves how to act because we just go by what is coming in and what we are hearing and how we perceive that. Let's take authority over our personal spirit and our, our will and our emotions. Let's take authority over our emotions and learn and grow in that and become new and become a better representative and a better ambassador for his kingdom. So I want to close with a prayer on blessing you guys and, and in myself that we learn this, that we become the kingdom of God in a physical form, that we bring His heaven here on earth. That is the ultimate picture. That is the goal that I see for this church and for everyone here and for the church in general is to bring His kingdom here on earth. That is, that is why He put us here. But first, we've got to start with ourselves. We've got to have the foundation of ourselves. Be established in ourselves. Be confident in who God is in myself. Be confident that He made me in His image. Even in my mistakes, I'm still in His image. I'm just getting rid of the stuff that isn't His image. So Father, I bless what You have in Your Word. I'm so grateful for how You speak to us. That You have answers in Your Word. That it gives us direction in helping us know You and in helping us know ourselves. That we can see glimpses and see parts of us that are made in Your image and that we know that there's more. There's always more of You in us. That we can learn and grow in it. That we accept it as a reality and as, as something that is going to manifest in tomorrow and in today and be a fruit that comes from Your Spirit. Thank You, Father, for Your grace and Your mercy that's new every morning that gives us a chance and an opportunity every single morning to accept in our physical soul your righteousness and your joy and your peace by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.